Okay, so uh, today uh, we're going to have the second part of the mad dash through space weather, okay? So uh, really, the, uh, as I mentioned in the, during the, the first class, that uh, the first two classes, the basic idea was to just throw a lot of stuff, stuff at you, okay? Um, I don't expect that you're going to remember all of this. And it's that's really not the purpose, or understand all of it. It's not really the purpose. Uh, the purpose is just to give you sort of initial exposure, pretty much to the whole field. Okay. Uh, so we've talked about the physics. We've talked talked about the impacts a little bit already. Then we changed a little bit of the schedule, so we had the uh, data dissemination class in between. But the goal today is to uh, expose you to the observations available out there, some of the applications, and then also start talking about where the rubber really hits the road. Talk about the operations. Okay, how how you use these capabilities to generate services for the end users, and what types of procedures you use for providing these services to to variety to a variety of end users. Okay. So uh, that's that's the purpose of this uh, part two. Uh, um, again, a lot of information, uh, uh, but uh, throughout the semester we're going to be drilling much more in detail to individual components that, that we're going to cover today. Okay. So the, the the key topics that we'll be discussing today are uh, uh, we will be discussing some of the the central space with observations, uh, both ground based and space based. Uh, that we have available to us today to monitor and you know estimate the state of the space weather. Um, then we will uh, go and start talking a little bit more in detail about the applications. Uh, for example, how you use this uh, this observational capability and how you use different kinds of models to generate uh, in information, really actionable information for the end users. Okay, and then depending how we're doing uh, time-wise. Uh, uh, the, the last part, we're going to jump into the actual space of the operations. Uh, so how uh, observations and these applications are used to provide actionable information to the end users. And I will definitely try to drill down the, the very, very uh, great importance of this actionable information term. You have to have actionable information in order to provide something to the end user that he or she can use to actually take some action. That's that's really that's really one of the, the sort of ultimate goals of space weather activities to provide to have the capability to provide that kind of information for your customer. Okay. Before we go to the actual material, uh, we have our weekly review, and I asked that Erin would give a review this week. Uh, you, I know you sent me some links. Do you yeah. want me to pull them up? Yeah, just. So let's go to my email box. Hopefully we don't have any, anything embarrassing here. No. Not in your email, but in the other email. <laughs> okay. So yeah, which one? Go to the bottom? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you this one. Sorry. Yeah, just hold it. All right. It's a pulsing the data this way for a second. Different on my computer. Yeah, let's change the size. Stuck in 30%. <laughs> Which network? Room? Where am I? Okay. 60. Yeah, ISO is not very good if you're in a modem connection or something. <laughs> you need a little bit of horsepower in terms of. Yeah, there. Yeah. Okay, um, so there were two events last week um, that I wanted to highlight. The first one is a solar flare that occurred on September 8th uh, between 1735 and 1820. Uh, it was ranked a class M1.4 and its location was 14 degrees south and 40 degrees west. And you can see it 
uh, very faintly in that first um, picture towards the bottom right. Oh, yeah, yeah, right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second event is the coronal mass ejection, which you can see in the um, second coronagraph. Um, and that occurred on September 8th as well, but in the morning at around 1042. Mm -hmm. um, its location was 120 longitude and negative 19 latitude um, in the heliocentric Earth elliptic. And its speed was about 920 kilometers per second mm -hmm. uh, with an angular width of 150 degrees and rank type C. Mm -hmm. And other than that, it was pretty, pretty quiet. Pretty quiet. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Good job. Um, so, fairly quiet again. That's fine. Okay. So, let's go back here. So, that was our, our uh, space of the review, uh, the condition review today. Um, and then let's then go into the actual actual meat meat of the other uh, class today. Um, one one of the, the key points that I tried to drill down during the uh, the run through space of the uh, one class was that uh, we're we're tackling pretty serious problem here uh, in terms of trying to uh, uh, observe, monitor, and model and and even predict uh, uh, the space weather. Uh, one of the challenges is that we're dealing with huge range of scales, both in, in spatial uh, uh, sense and also in, in, in temporal sense, okay? And, and you really need to capture uh, a lot of the central physical processes at all those different scales. And those scales are cross-coupled, so there is coupling bit across the different scales. So that, that gives you a little bit of understanding that you know, we're, we're talking uh, uh, with pretty you know, challenging, <laughs> challenging stuff here. Okay. Uh, another uh, kind of a uh, challenge that we're dealing with in space weather uh, in a day-to-day -day sense is that uh, uh, even though we have a lot of science missions, for example, space-based missions out there, uh, uh, providing a lot of information that can use to improve our physical understanding of the system, many of these missions do not have the capability to provide real-time data on the ground. Okay, so. The number of missions that provide actual usable near real-time data is much smaller than the actual total number of you know, space science missions uh, improving our understanding of the physics of the system. Okay? So that's, that's another limitation as well. So in terms of space of the information, uh, we're very much data starved. Okay? So the, the space is vastly understandable. Okay? Uh, if you compare in contrast to lower atmospheric weather community, where there are very dense networks of uh, stations, pretty much covering the whole globe, and then you have also pretty good coverage in terms of uh, space-based uh, monitoring, remote remote observations of the uh, atmospheric conditions. So the uh, regular weather folks, they have much better understanding of uh, the state of their system at any given time in comparison to the, the in comparison to the, the space weather community. Okay, and then really the other primary problem is that we're so undersampled in terms of uh, measuring the state of the system at variety of locations. Uh, you know, solar conditions, interplanetary conditions, magnetospheric conditions, ionospheric conditions, and so forth. Okay? So that's, that's another, another, another big challenge. Um, what I will do next is I will run you through uh, uh, much of the key near real-time uh, data sources out there. Okay? Uh, so I emphasize here that uh, if you don't see your own favorite uh, mission <laughs> being discussed here, uh, that's uh, probably uh, probably because it's not providing real-time data. Okay, uh, if if you know some mission that I'm not covering here and you know that provides a real-time uh, beacon data as well, let me know. Okay, because we want to use that data. <laughs> okay, uh, so here's a uh, uh, kind of a list. Uh, of both uh, ground-based and space-based uh, near real-time data sources. So I will be in the, in the following slides. I'll be going through kind of a, in a quick fashion all this uh, all these uh, uh, types of measurements, uh, uh, starting from ground-based. We'll go through from solar H alpha measurements through 
measurements of the geometrically induced currents, so GSs, which were a problem for, for the power grids, for example. And then we also discussed uh, space-based observations, going through from uh, solar EUV observations all the way down to the uh, ionospheric radio or occultation measurements, okay? One of the nice things uh, in terms of uh, measuring and monitoring uh, space weather is that the sun is, is, is very active animal, okay? Um, it's really emitting uh, information about space weather uh, really practically across uh, the, the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, here's a really good uh, picture that I stole from uh, Ashwanden, or uh, whatnot, how do you pronounce this name? Uh, 2004 book about the, the solar atmosphere. Uh, and and what, what he plotted here is uh, sort of a range of electro the uh, range of electromagnetic radiation coming from the solar phenomena. So really, the the active part of the sun covers emissions from from gamma rays, the very short wavelength uh, electromagnetic radiation, all the way to the uh, radio frequencies. Right. Uh, the lines here show uh, the, uh, the the irradiance. Of the radiation at, at any given uh, wavelength, okay, uh, or 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 frequency. Uh, most of the power, or the mo uh, most of the power in the uh, uh, in the emissions coming from the sun, electromagnetic emissions coming from the sun, is on the visible, ultraviolet, visible, and infrared part uh, of the spectrum. Now, the visible part is, of course, the the, the part of the, the spectrum that you know human eye can detect, okay. Uh, but there are also uh, other very dynamic parts of the spectrum. There are emissions uh, at gamma rays. There are emissions that are very important from the monitoring viewpoint uh, at, at uh, X-rays. Okay, you know, as Michael knows that you know, X-ray observations are very important for detecting flares. So the flares uh, can cause very dramatic changes in terms of uh, X-ray emissions coming from the sun. Uh, <clears throat> And then finally, we have also very dynamic spectra in the radio frequencies. Okay, so a lot of the, uh, the solar atmospheric phenomena create uh, electromagnetic radiation at the radio frequencies. Okay, and this is uh, one key to be able to observe solar phenomena from the ground. Okay? So really, the challenge is that we want to observe the solar phenomena throughout this range. Okay. And if we can capture this range, we know already quite a bit about the state of the sun itself, and the state of the solar active phenomenon. Right? Now, from the ground-based uh, viewpoint, um, we have a problem. Uh, uh, we have Earth's atmosphere. That is a huge pain. <laughs> yeah, it's very inconvenient to have an atmosphere. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, please somebody get rid of our atmosphere. Uh, the thing is that we have uh, only a couple windows throughout this uh, uh, spectrum where we can observe the solar phenomena using the ground-based uh, instrumentation. We have couple windows uh, uh, at about uh, visible uh, wavelengths. That's why we can actually see the sun when we look at the sky, right? Uh, and then we have another window at radio frequencies. Okay. At other frequencies, uh, the electromagnetic radiation from the sun is absorbed uh, by the atmosphere or the radiation is reflected from the atmosphere. Okay. So when we are observing the sun uh, from the ground, we're, we're going to have to attack these two windows that are available to us. Okay. So let's start from uh, ground-based uh, solar uh, H-alpha observations. Um, H alpha is uh, uh, an emission at uh, 600, uh, 656.3 nanometers coming from the, the hydrogen, chromospheric hydrogen. Uh, and these types of emissions uh, uh, coming from the, the hydrogen in the uh, uh, solar atmosphere allow us to image, for example, chromospheric filaments. Uh, we talked about this in you know, the run through space weather when we talked about the filaments versus uh, 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 prominences, okay? And, and you know, I checked what Amy was saying that uh, it, it, indeed it, it is the, the definition when, you know, the prominence is in the limb, <laughs> it's called filament, and when it's out, uh, 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 when it's in the disc, 
it's called filament, and when it's out in the limb, you can see the side view that then it's called prominence. Okay, but you know, physics-wise, they're the same exact thing, right? Um, the largest network, operational network, providing uh, real-time data at uh, H alpha data, uh, is the Global Oscillation Network or GONG. Uh, Gong has a number of stations distributed around the globe. Now remember, the, from the ground-based viewpoint, uh, we have a problem again, you know, observing the sun because we're on a rotating sphere, okay? At times you can see the sun, but sometimes you're on the, the night side and you, you can't see the sun, all right? So in order to have continuous way uh, to observe this phenomena, you need to have a number stations okay so gong has a number of stations distributed around the world so you can have, you can have uh, uh, continuous uh, observations given the, the atmospheric conditions if there's no thunderstorms or huge uh, you know a lot of clouds you know that of course can be a, you know uh, something that you know uh, creates problems for, for, for your uh, regular observations but the gong has a uh, a network of, of these kinds of stations. Here's an example of one of the stations. So uh, you have the optics here on the left hand side and then you have uh, additional optics that beam the signal into the, the uh, actual instruments that are inside inside this box. And they have these kinds of boxes distributed around the world. Okay, I think have, they have five or, five or six stations in st strategic locations. Um, let's then take a look at how uh, the sun looks at H alpha. So uh, let's go to ice one. You maximize this. Hopefully, this is not going to take too long. Download. Zero. Well, that's encouraging. Wow. Okay. It's probably because I'm beaming uh, the uh, data stream to YouTube. All right, well, we have time here. Um, so what I will be showing here is, uh, I think we discussed last uh, class in the Marlow Maddox's class, the August 31st filament eruption this year. Okay. Uh, so what I will be showing here is the H alpha imagery of that same filament eruption. Okay. The 2003? Yeah. Oh, you're talking about it. This is, this is August 31st of oh, okay. uh, this year. I was in that. I thought, yeah. Uh, you're, you're talking about the Halloween storm. Uh, that was October uh, October 29 to November 1st, 2003. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, but that, that was a huge eruption as well. Uh, that, that's what, what in the field we call Halloween storm events of October, November 2003. And, and that was the largest storm, uh, or largest event uh, of that solar cycle. So it was a major event. It caused blackout in southern Sweden. It caused a problem, you know, permanent damage of uh, high voltage power transformers in South Africa. There were a lot of uh, flights rerouted because uh, of the event, and then there were all kinds of problems. Also, you know, I think there was uh, one Japanese uh, spacecraft that was lost. Uh, because of the uh, the uh, enhanced radiation at the orbit and so forth, so it was definitely a major event. Uh, this filament eruption that we had this year, August thirty first, was nothing of that like. Okay, uh, but this illustrates the point uh, how you can use H alpha, ground based H alpha, to actually observe these eruptions as well. Okay, so what I have here is uh, uh, H alpha from Big Bear Station uh, of the Gong Network. Um, and what you can see here is, uh, I think, a sequence of, of uh, maybe maybe an hour or so. And uh, let's wait until this comes to a start. It's kind of a slow. Okay, so here we're in the start, boom. And here's the, the very classic signature filament. It's kind of a dark, dark feature in the solar chromosphere. This is now cooler than the surroundings. And then over this sequence, you can see that how that filament uh, disappears. All right, uh, that's an indication that that filament went somewhere. Okay, uh, so it, it erupted, and so you can see 
that it gets dimmer and dimmer. And actually, if you really look closely, you can see that, that, that actually there's something flying out here <laughs> on the lamp that is part of that erupting filament as well. Okay, so this is a very classic uh, 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 disappearing filament in the H alpha imager. Okay, so this is one way to detect that there was a there was an eruption. You said there's five to six of these specific um, ground stations. Yes. So are they all one I saw, or just this one? Uh, all all Gong stations, all H alpha from Gong is available through Ice Wave. This, uh, this is a big bear station, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you have to find the station that was operational at the time uh, of the event of your interest. All right. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. So that's that's H alpha. Um, Another uh, physical feature you can observe, uh, ground-based, is the photospheric magnetic field, all right? Uh, and that's thanks to Zeeman effect, okay? So this is, this is quantum mechanical effect. So when you have a spectral line, emission or absorption line, and you expose the system to a magnetic field, it changes the spectral characteristics of that line, all right? So here's an example uh, of that effect. So on the left-hand side, we have, uh, I think this is a visible uh, 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 wavelength picture of the, the solar, solar, solar uh, surface. Uh, this is a sunspot, obviously, here. And, and as we learned in the first class, the, the dark regions are where you have enhanced magnetic field. Okay. Um, then you have a slit of the spect spectrograph that takes a narrow image along this line. Okay, and that spectrograph data is then shown here on the right hand side, right? And on the horizontal axis, what you have varying is the wavelength of the data given by the spectrograph, and and from uh, bottom to top, you you move along, you move you move along along this slit here. Okay. So if we follow this individual spectral line here, uh, if you look, uh, compare, for example, the layers at the, the bottom of the image, uh, you can see that there's not too much uh, distortion of that individual spectral line. But as you move upwards to uh, pretty much closer to the central location of the sunspot, you can see that there's a change in the spectral line. There's a splitting of, of this, this line. Okay. And that's a classic Zeeman effect, okay? So you're splitting the spectral lines uh, by adding, adding a magnetic field into the picture, okay? And now also Zeeman effect changes the, the polarization characteristics of the, 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 these uh, emission lines, for example. And it's actually those polarization characteristics that, you know, allow you to uh, observe the photospheric line of sight magnetic field remotely, okay? But the key idea here is that the Zeeman effect changes the spectral characteristics and you know by observing those spectral char characteristics you can actually extract information about uh, uh, the photospheric magnetic field also from the ground. Um, so let's take another look. Uh, of uh, example of line of sight uh, photospheric magnetic field observations again from the, the Gong, Gong net network. Oh boy, these all are gonna last forever. Jeez. And I have a lot of these examples. <laughs> oh. Nothing's happening. Come on. You gotta be kidding me. Alright, so let's let's do this by hand then. Let's go to Aiswa. Oh, boy. And um, just to get an example here. Just to give you an idea how the, how the data looks here. Um, so this is a uh, magnetogram line of sight uh, uh, for the straight magnetic field. Again, from a gong, one of the gong stations, this is uh, station El Teda, okay? 
So what you can see here, uh, this is the latest image taken uh, at, at that station. So you can see that you have these concentrations of uh, black and white areas, and these are maps of different polarities of the line of sight magnetic field at those photospheric locations. Okay, so this is a classic classic way of looking at at the, the solar solar magnetic field. Okay. Uh, right. So that's that's the uh, uh, photospheric magnetic field. Now, the similar or the same uh, gong, for example, gong instrumentation uh, uh, has so-called a uh, Michelson interferometer, and and this thing allows you to observe uh, Doppler Doppler shifts in the spectral lines. So you observe uh, a certain spectral line if the, the wavelength uh, moves to a shorter range or longer range than it's expected. Uh, it's an indication that uh, whatever is emitting uh, that line is moving okay, towards the observer or away from the observer. And those fluctuations allow you to measure the fluctuations uh, on the solar surface. Okay? And those fluctuations enable you to do helioseismic studies. Again, very similar to seismic studies on the surface of the Earth, where you measure the fluctuations, for example, during earthquakes of the ground, right? Those fluctuations you can use to probe the structure of the, the interior parts of the Earth, actually, okay? You can do the same exact thing here. So by observing those fluctuations across the solar disk, you can build a picture about the, the internal structure of the sun, okay? And now the cool thing from the space with a viewpoint is that you can actually use this technique to image structures on the far side of the sun, okay? Not on the, the you know, the part that you're seeing, but something that is uh, on the back side, on the far side, all right? So here's an example of, of uh, this kind of a far side product from Gong uh, that I also created in real time. Uh, so here's the, the Earth's uh, Earth uh, facing side and these uh, Concentrations, concentrations here now indicate uh, 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 more more than uh, sort of a background typical uh, uh, magnetic fields, okay, magnetic field strains. Uh, and then, in addition to Earth side, you can have all you, you also have information through these helioseismic techniques about the far far side activity, okay. So you can actually map these concentrations of the magnetic field on the far side of the sun using these kind of helioseismic technologies. And then this is this is very cool. Okay, uh, now obviously at this point of time we have stereo spacecraft uh, uh, that provide direct observations also from the far side, but the stereo spacecraft are not going to be there forever. Uh, they're drifting away, and at some point uh, we're going to lose connection with those guys. And at that point, these types of far side techniques will be very valuable to know what's going to uh, uh, come towards us at later times. Okay. Thank you. Is it a like, physical reason, just in physics, that they can only get absolute value of B, or is that just, can they get the sign of B? Uh, from the, the helioseismic? Yeah, because I can see the thing right there that they're only showing that. Yes. Uh, what this is, this is actually so-called a uh, calibrated image. Uh, so actual raw data that you get from this technique is the, the local velocity of the wave propagation. Okay, And then what these folks have done is that they have uh, calibrated that local velocity. Uh, to to uh, certain magnetic field strains, and they have done the calibration here for the absolute magnitude of the magnetic field. Uh, uh, I don't know, to be honest, if they have tried to extract any information about the polarity, but I would suspect that it's it's going to be a very tough task. Okay, uh, and I'm I'm doubtful that you would be able to get information about the polarity of the field using this type of technique. Uh, but that's something that we we could check check it out and confirm. Okay. Um, another important uh, uh, type of ground-based instrumentation are uh, solar radio telescopes, okay, uh, that observe uh, the solar phenomena uh, roughly between uh, 10 megahertz and, and 10 gigahertz. Okay? Uh, the 10 megahertz is, is uh, very close to the ionospheric cutoff, so it's, it's very difficult to uh, get signals to pass through the ionosphere uh, below 10 megahertz range, okay? Uh, and then we discussed this in the space plasma physics. This is the local plasma frequency, and at that point, the wave, wave gets reflected, right? 
so you cannot get information from outside below below the local plasma frequency. Um, here's an example of uh, one station again of so-called radio solar telescope network uh, RSTN. Uh, this is another network uh, that is uh, operated uh, by U.S. Air Force. Okay, um, similar to Gong, uh, in in this network they have again number of stations around the globe, so you can uh, they can provide a continuous 24/7 coverage of uh, solar radio observations. All right. Um, on the right-hand side of here, we have an example of data from these types of observations. So what we have here is on the horizontal axis, uh, we have a time running, um, uh, which is in, in minutes. Uh, 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 you know, so we have here about one hour of data or so. And then on the vertical axis, we have the frequency that ranges, in this case, from about 30, 30 uh, uh, megahertz to maybe 130 megahertz or so. Okay. So here's a classic example of a solar radio burst. Okay, uh, these are called type two bursts. So the burst starts at higher frequencies, and then you have over time, you know, over time of some, you know, tens of minutes, uh, the, the frequency of those emissions decreases. And this is a signature of some a signature of something moving in the solar corona. Okay. So the local plasma frequency, the magnetic field decreases, also the local plasma frequency gets lower and lower, and, and associated emissions also are generated at lower and lower frequencies. Okay? So these types of observations actually uh, allow you to uh, build sort of a, uh, initial estimates for the, the speed of these propagating structures in the solar, solar atmosphere. Okay? They allow you to detect, of course, the bursts, the events, but also extract information about the speed of the, uh, the, uh, the, of these transients in the solar atmosphere, right? So that's, that's the, the uh, 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 radio telescope stuff, looking directly at the sun, looking at emissions from, from the, coming from the sun, okay? Um, then there's another very interesting uh, uh, radio uh, frequency-based technique that allow you to extract information about the solar wind structure, okay? And that technique is based on uh, uh, interplanetary scintillation. So what, uh, in this technique you do, you will observe, instead of sun, other celestial radio sources, okay, in, in the sky. And once you observe certain sources, you observe also the intensity of the emission coming from that source, and then fluctuations in the intensity of the signal from that source uh, gives you a level of scintillation, or you can call it, you know, twinkling, twinkling at that source, right? Uh, and this twinkling or the scintillation is actually caused by density structures in the solar wind. Okay, so here's an uh, illustration of the situation. So sun is here at the center, uh, the Earth uh, is orbiting sun over here, and this blob here illustrates uh, a coronal mass ejection. Okay. So if we have here a radio source uh, and the signal from the radio source is not passing through any, any significant solar wind structures, you have very low level of, of scintillation, of a background level of scintillation in the signal that you're observing. But if that uh, signal needs to pass through these enhanced density structures, for example, associated with coronal mass ejections, that introduces uh, additional twinkling of that signal. Okay. And that twinkling then carries information about these structures that are propagating, potentially propagating in the solar wind. Okay, so this allows now to carry out remote sensing of the structures propagating in the solar wind from the ground. Okay, so this is this is one of the really cool, cool kind of a new techniques you can use to observe observe the structures in the interplanetary medium. Um, here's an example of actual data product from interplanetary scintillation measurements. Uh, this is uh, created by uh, a solar terrestrial en environment laboratory uh, at Nagoya University. Uh, this is a sort of a fish eye view, uh, a full sky view uh, to, to upwards. So, you know, you're looking at uh, upwards and you have kind of like a fish islands to extract information from all directions. Uh, and what is shown here on the map is a so-called G level, which is the, really the, the relative level of fluctuations in that signal that you're observing. So if the G level is equal to one, it means that the fluctuations in the signal are on the overall average level of fluctuations, okay? Um, 
And what you have here also, these circles actually show uh, uh, the latest observation points. I've, I've extracted this information uh, September 8th, uh, uh, earlier this week. And these circles show here the latest interplanetary scintillation observations. Okay? And over time, then you can start building a map of the scintillations uh, through, throughout, throughout the, 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 the sky that you are able to observe. And this information then you can use in actual models that in a tomographic fashion can build a three-dimensional picture of these moving structures in, in the interplanetary medium. We're going to, in, in the later on classes this semester, we'll be talking about this tomographic ma mapping of the solar wind structures using this technique. Uh, actually, there's a product uh, uh, in ISWA also available uh, that uses this tomographic mapping technique to predict the solar wind conditions at the uh, orbit of the Earth. So this is this is really nice uh, radio uh, frequency based technique to map uh, the Solomon structure. Um, then moving closer uh, or moving all the way to the surface of the Earth, um, we can also detect galactic cosmic rays on the ground. Okay, and this is uh, thanks to this kind of a showering effect. We cannot really detect the, the primary galactic cosmic ray particles themselves but we can detect uh, sort of a secondary effects of those individual rays, okay? So here, here's a sort of a, a graphical illustration of what's going on. So we have uh, the primary galactic cosmic ray coming from some direction. It hits the atmosphere of the Earth and causes this kind of a massive shower of, of secondary effects, elementary particle uh, uh, interactions, okay? And uh, one component of those interactions of, or of the shower is uh, uh, neutrons. So the shower creates also neutrons, okay? And you can observe those neutrons on the ground, okay? So by observing the neutrons on the ground, you will have indirect information about the galactic cosmic rays themselves, all right? And, and um, we have this neutron monitor observations available in ISWA as well. So let's take a look at that. Oh, that loaded quickly. Yay! But it's not near that, you know, when you give some demonstration, you know, you know, and you have a huge audience there, and you're trying to show how cool this tool is, and they have no uh, really bad network connection, and then you try to get images through, and, you know, it takes minutes and minutes, you know, you start sweating, mm -hmm. that, what the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so, but anyhow, so we, this time, you know, I pulled, pulled the data quite quickly. Um, let's see. So what we have here is uh, neutron monitor data from uh, uh, one of the stations. This station is uh, in Oulu. It's actually from Finland. So there's also a network of these neutron monitor stations, you know, that pretty much cover the globe, right? Uh, uh, so you get picture of, you know, galactic cosmic ray, rays coming from from different directions to different uh, magnetic field environments. Also, the structure of the Earth's magnetic field actually is very important uh, from the viewpoint where you can where you can observe this the, these kinds of enhancements. But we're going to talk more more about that, you know, once we get to the magnetic side of the physics later later this semester. But uh, here's an example: uh, uh, these kind of noise and fluctuations early on in this period. This is a classic signature of you no know, background galactic cosmic cosmic ray component. But then you can see this very nice enhancements in the middle middle of this period. This is amazing.